currently share Bellator's 145-pound spotlight. While the MMA world anxiously awaits the April 15th rematch between the dynamic duo of Patricio Pitbull and AJ McKee, a poised and powerful pair of featherweights sit at the division's doorstep, waiting for their chance to challenge for the top spot. Tonight, Adam the Kid Borich and Mads Burnell, both number two in the rankings, will enter the cage and fight for the right to become number one and next in line for the Bellator strap. At 205, Vadim Nemkov and Corey Anderson are set to duel for the title in the upcoming World Grand Prix Final. But first, there's a couple of contenders that could be one step away from a world title return. Former champ Phil Davis is no stranger to long roads. He's actually claimed light heavyweight gold twice. While former title challenger Julius Unglickskis hopes a win over Mr. Wonderful will earn him a second bite at the World Championship Apple. It's Davis versus Unglickskis, and Boric battles Burnell in a Bellator MMA double feature. St. Charles, Missouri, a northwestern suburb of St. Louis situated on the Missouri River. And Bellator 276, like the crowd, flows into Family Arena, where tonight's main event, a fantastic five-round, 145-pound fight, has title implications. The streaking Adam Boric, winner of three in a row since suffering his lone loss in 18 pro fights, takes on the surging Mads Burnell, who is riding a career-high seven-fight winning streak. Hello there, I'm Mauro Ranallo. Bellator's 145-pound division is filled with sharks, so it's only fitting that the crown jewel will be up for grabs at the Shark Tank on Friday, April 15. Bellator MMA is going, going, back, back to Cali Cali with a must-see rematch between the gold standard A.J. McKee and former two-division kingpin Patricio Pitbull, who will try to turn the rivalry into a trilogy. Now, Pitbull, who will join me for a chat later tonight, is 6-1 and one in rematches, while the 18-0 McKee runs it back for the first time. All right, from quoting Biggie Smalls to saying hello to Big John McCarthy, should a Pitbull be unable to force a rubber match with McKee? That means the winner of tonight's main event will be at the front of the line. The stakes are sky high for Borch and Burnell. Give us your breakdown. Look, he said it right. This fight is so important for both, but they both are incredible fighters. They just approach the fight in different ways. Borch is this guy who is fast, long, just incredibly explosive at any moment in the fight. Look at the flying knee knockouts that he's had. He can just end a fight at any moment. He has that strength, he has that speed, and he is now back having confidence. But Brunel is kind of different. He's a guy that's a controller. He's a guy that takes you out of your element, puts you in his, and then squeezes the life out of you. He is unbelievable with his variety of attacks. He will ground and pound you. He will hit a Japanese necktie from anywhere. This guy, once the fight hits the ground, is special. He does things that other guys wish they could do. This is a incredible matchup. Boric and Burnell are both looking to turn their shared number two ranking into a solo numero uno in a loaded featherweight division. Hey, another number two is in action tonight. Former Bellator 205-pound top dog Phil Davis takes on recent title challenger and local favorite Julius Unglickskis. He's ranked number four. A mouth-watering middleweight matchup. It's the number one ranked John Salter looking to bounce back from falling short in his quest for championship glory against the undefeated number three ranked Johnny Eblin who faces the toughest exam of his blossoming career. 
after repeated scale fails, the unbeaten J.J. Wilson now campaigning at 155, and he promises to deliver against Gaji Rabadinov what Rabadinov produced in his Bellator MMA debut, a spectacular finish. Look, J.J. Wilson is a beast on the feet. He's got power in his hands on the ground. He is fantastic and can take you anywhere in the fight. His problem has been making weight. That's why he has moved up to the 155-pound weight class. This kid, 8-0, is fantastic. His opponent, that's what he can do. Look at the power. He puts Daniel Carey out, puts him down. One more shot. He is out. He's got great wrestling, big power in his hands. This fight is going to be fire. We are all members of the MMA family here at Family Arena tonight as we go to the tail of the tape for our opening contest. 16-4-1 for Gachi, but 8-0. Does J.J. Wilson continue on his streak? We're going to find out. It's time to begin the main card of Bellator 276. Here is the voice of Bellator MMA, Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to Bellator MMA Live on Showtime from Family Arena here in St. Charles, Missouri. We're set now here at Bellator 276 to get things underway with three five-minute rounds in the lightweight division. Introducing the blue corner at five foot eight, weighing in 155.8 pounds. His professional record, 16 wins, four losses, one draw, presenting Gaji Rabadono. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot 11, weighing in 156 pounds even as a professional. He stands undefeated, eight victories, no defeats, Introducing J.J. the Maori Kid Wilson. In charge of the action, your referee Jason Herzog. J.J. Wilson fighting Ralph, how are you ready? as a lightweight ready? for the first time fight. against Gaji Rabadanov, currently on a two-fight win streak, has won eight of his last nine, but Wilson immediately brings the fight to Rabadanov, who tries to fend him off with a couple of left hands. Wilson got hurt with that left hand, though. He got stung, so he needs to be uh, just a little bit more in control of his actions. It was a nice spinning back fist to start. Let's see if he can just slow himself down just a little. An explosive start by J.J. Wilson. Five wins via first round knockout or submission. Two KOs, three subs. For Abadanov, he is coming off a scary knockout win over Daniel Carey in Rabadanov's Bellator MMA debut, a vicious KO that took place at Bellator 263 last July. Yeah, well, all the fights that we've seen with Rabadanov, the one thing he, he has got power. There's guys out there that you know they, they can punch. This guy's got that one punch snap that will end the night for you. You can see he's hurting JJ with those shots. And Wilson attempting to return fire. I kick. Wilson, wild right hand, out of range. And you're right, John, needs to settle things down a bit again. Just 24 years of age, knows, you know, as we mentioned, has missed weight on numerous occasions. In fact, in his last fight, was supposed to face Adam Boric at featherweight. Boric, of course, will now face Mads Burnell in the main event tonight with title implications. So, Wilson still very young, still very much learning. Absolutely. And, you know, look, at 8-0, he's a young fighter, and there's things he's got to learn. Right now, he's he's trying to throw a little too hard. Just needs to settle down. He's against a guy that's going to be very patient, but when he explodes, Rabadanov, he's got power, and you need to be very respectful of the power that he carries. And we talk about Rabadanov's impressive win in his last fight for Wilson. Again, just 24 vicious calf kick by Wilson. He stopped a former title challenger in Pedro Carvalho. So 
You know, despite not even having 10 professional fights, he has been in the deep waters. Well, he's been in with some very good fighters, Taiwan Claxton being one, but there's levels to everything. And when you're taking a look at the wrestling ability of Rabatinov and then just the calmness of his attack, he doesn't overextend, he doesn't give you a whole lot. JJ right now is, is, is landing that calf kick, but he's also eating a jab every time that he's doing it. So it's a trade-off. He just needs to be calm, pick his spots, and just let the fight come to him. Rabatanov, one of the students of MMA legend Abib Nurmagomedov, and for Rabatanov, he's talked about wanting to showcase exactly what makes him not just a fighter, but a human being. And this is the truth. This is the circle of truth of Bellator MMA cage, John. There's no doubt about that. You're seeing that Rabatanov's being a little cautious. Yeah. He sees what JJ is setting up as far as the spinning attacks. He's being very respectful of that. Wilson has to be careful not to telegraph those attacks. Fainted with the right. Rabatanov bouncing up and down, shifting as Wilson attacks the lead leg, and there, Rabatanov threw the kick, caught off balance. He caught him off that back leg. We all extended all the way through on that, but that lead leg attack that JJ has been committed to is a good idea. It's a smart move by JJ just to stop what Rabatanov has as far as power. And again, the spinning back fist, and that may have hurt Wilson. We heard the flash of leather meeting leather and, uh, yeah, bone on bone there as well. And there's a push kick from Wilson, but we'll have to monitor that right hand, John. Yeah, you'll have to see if he throws it. As we see Rabadanov throw a combination. Under a minute left in the opening round. Oh, it was a beautiful oh. kick by JJ. And there, Wilson having his best He's to settle down, but that was a very nice attack by JJ, and I love that he was going after him with multiples. Coming up on the final 30 seconds of the first frame, scheduled for three rounds in the Bellator MMA lightweight division. And again, the spinning back fist, the kick is blocked. 15 seconds left in the round. Wilson looking for the flashy finish. Rabadanov has defended it all thus far as we head to round number two here at Family Arena in St. Charles, Missouri. John, I want to ask you about the repeated spinning attacks by J.J. Wilson early in the fight. Look, what J.J. is doing is he's making Rabadanov have to consider what he's doing and, and make it to where sometimes he's not sure if those spinning attacks are coming. They're a good thing. We thought he might have hurt his hand on the one, but he came back with another one. So, so he could be setting traps. He's setting traps, and that's exactly why it's an effective technique. Notice how he's doing it. He's setting it up. He's giving a little bit of a tell with it. That was the left hand that Rabatinov hit Wills with it. I said that hurt him. You could see him stumble a little bit. This is right at the end of the round. They got into a little exchange there. A little bit after the bell. Got to love that. But that wow, beautiful that front kick, that landed well. And then you saw him repeat with another shot off of it. Godzi doing a good job of circling out, getting his distance. Nice round for both guys. Somewhere Shoney Carter's probably saying, yeah, nice attempt at the spinning back fist, but that's not the Chicago special. <laughs> it's actually called something else, but Mr. It cannot be repeated. <laughs> But where Bears repeating is just how important this fight is for both of these relative youngsters. Wilson again, 24. Rabadanov, 29 years of age. Obviously, Rabadanov with a huge edge in experience. Uh, and in the opening round, I think John McCarthy had Wilson. Was he edging Rabadanov? Just edge, and there was just you know, that, that kick to the face help. There was the big good punch by Rabatanov, but there was little things, and the leg kicks was a difference maker for me, for Wilson. Wilson checked that leg kick by Rabatanov again, threatening with the lead left hook, fainting, and there's a nice attack to the lead leg by Rabatanov before he escapes. But he also ate another leg kick from Wilson. He, Wilson is continuing on with that attack. But it would behoove Rabatanov to continue his attack on the lead leg of Wilson to try to slow down the Maori kid. 
Nice job of JJ to block that. But yeah, doing a great job of checking the exactly. ball. Exactly. And now closes the gap, and Wilson looking to take Ravadanov. Potentially down, has the waist lock. Uh, looking for the takedown, Ravadanov momentarily hung, hanging on to the fence. Momentarily, he grabbed the fence, <laughs> trying to keep himself from going down. There's not many times you're going to get an opportunity like J.J. had in getting Rabotanov down. He had his hands clasped around in a body lock. He elevates it. That grab of the cage makes a difference. Referee Jason Herzog, one of the best, just out of position. They're not seeing the attempt by Rabotanov. And yet, John, as we uh, move along here in the second round, again, this... This game of inches, the, the, the battle of attrition along the fence. Yeah, and this is right now. On the uh, exit, nice right hand landed by Wilson. I love the way that J.J. exited that moment. Make him pay. If he's going to try to get away from you at that, make him pay for it. Two minutes gone in the second. Rabadinov trying to get on track. High guard fainting, yet eats the counter from Wilson and gets struck again by J.J. Wilson. It's a nice left hook to the oh, body. Uh, right uppercut left hand, and then a body kick by Wilson. Wilson feeling that here at lightweight, he would be faster. While a lot of lightweights will, of course, naturally be bigger, but against uh, Rabadanov, that's not the case. And nice. Wilson putting the attack again on Rabadanov. Beautiful two-punch combination landed on Rabadanov cleanly. And you see there's a difference right now. Rabadanov is a lot more tentative in coming forward than he was in the first round. Rabadanov has tasted defeat four times, has been stopped three times, including twice via TKO. Coming up on two minutes, remaining in the middle frame, lead left hook by Rabadanov, counter right from Wilson. And Rabadanov looking for the takedown, almost walked into the knee, but does secure the takedown. Wilson very active off his back. He is active off the back, and we're gonna see what he does here. He cannot just sit in guard. He needs to make Rabadanov work from this position. Do not allow him to have free opportunities to use ground and pound. Right now, what you're seeing is that's not 100% what he's doing with his leg. He's taking his arm, controlling with his leg to keep it locked up on the arm of Rabatinov so that arm gets locked in place and he becomes a one-arm fighter. Wilson started training jiu-jitsu at the age of 16, is a BJJ black belt already at the age of 24, but Rabatinov looking to work the body, now close guard of Wilson. See, right now, as you see the angles changing, that's good as far as what J.J. Wilson is doing underneath. But every time you see Rabotanov square himself back up, he's the one that's going to be in control of this ground position. Active guard of Wilson neutralizing the posture of Ganchi Rabadonov or Rabadonov. I was told by Michael C. Williams, it is tomato, tomato when it comes to pronunciation. So we'll go with that. 45 seconds left in the second round. And it's complete lockdown here for Wilson, but while Rabadanov trying to create an opportunity for some offense, Wilson looking for the submission. Well, he's looking to try to get that leg up into a triangle position, but Rabadanov understands what's going on. Oh, and there's some ground and pound from Rabadanov. That was a clean shot by Rabadanov. Final 20 seconds of the second round. Wilson does have four submission wins, and his managed to neutralize the offensive attack of Gaji Rabadanov from top position while being active with his guard as we head to the third and final round of this lightweight affair. We continue to see the maturation process of J.J. Wilson in that round, John. J.J. was doing very well in that round, all the way up to the point where that takedown was completed by Rabotanov. It was a matter of J.J. tried to do good things on the ground. He just wasn't able to pull them off, and he took a couple of big shots. That was a beautiful right hand landed here by J.J. This is that moment where I said he hurt him with that shot. It was a clean shot, two-punch combination. Nice shot with the left hook by Rabotanov landing. But the big difference in the round was the take. Well, I was going to say, is it a big difference, John, because of what the what you saw with the offense? I wanted to ask you, does that negate this? Well, what it, what happens is 
you didn't have JJ being able to be offensive like he was when he was on his feet. He was more defensive in controlling position. He had a couple of big shots landed on him. He landed some little things, but he's losing all of those battles. All right, well, so the battle here round round, buddy, you ready? in round number buddy, three. How do you have it after 10 minutes on your unofficial scorecard? Unofficially, I have this fight even. This is up for either fighter. Who wants it the most right now? And so the reason for the score in the second round was essentially the takedown and what happened there. Yeah, I had JJ up just a little bit going before that takedown, but then you take a look at a couple of the big shots that Gaji ended up landing and the little shots piling up, not that they were big, he squeaks by with the round. Vicious body kick right under the armpit for Wilson. Wilson comes through the wide open guard of Rabadanov and again initiating the attack. But that was a beautiful attack by JJ because if you noticed, he was hiding that kick behind the hands. Yep. Fighting down on his punches. J.J. Wilson fighting for the first time here in Bellator at 155 pounds against Gaji Rabadanov. Lots of experience for Rabadanov. This is his 22nd professional fight. Nice touch jab into the takedown. Beautifully executed by Rabadanov, and I love the way he set it up with a blinding jab. Took the jab, dropped levels, gave him a ride on Air Dagestani there. JJ cannot just stay in this position. He needs to work his way back. Oh, and immediately Rabadanov takes the back and now stretching out Wilson. Smooth as a butter here in the third round. Forgotcha Rabadanov, nice escape by Wilson. Reset on their feet. But you can see how this fight has changed as far as the structure of it. Look at the body language. Rabadanov, who was always moving forward, is now moving backwards. You're seeing JJ starting to stalk it, and you're seeing Rabadanov looking for those takedowns now because he feels he has an advantage if he gets that. Again, Wilson leading with the right hand, able to score. That was a right idea by that kick that he threw right at the end. He tried to get that in there. He hit the kick behind the hands and just missed the target. That calf kick landed for Rabadanov. Wilson has done a decent job of defending a lot of the kicks and then comes forward with a one-two. Rabadanov circling away, maybe beginning to feel the effects, trying to Find that second win here with two and a half left in the third round. Again, Wilson checking the calf kick. And you can see that that left leg of Rabadanov is actually starting to give him yes. some problems. He's starting to get a little stiff on it, doesn't have that same spring, and he's tending to switch his stance more often. Oh, and again secures the takedown. That's the second takedown accrued by Gaji Rabadanov. He is known for his power, his transitions, and his wrestling, and yet was unable to do a lot with the takedown in that second round. Did score intermittently, but what? how does he improve upon his position here? Look, if he's gonna improve on what he's doing, he's gotta, in, instead of being in this where he's keeping his chest to chest, he's gonna actually have to give space like you just posture saw, up. posture and throw heavy shots and make J.J. pay for being in this position right now. J.J. needs to start. He's got his legs inside. That's all good work. Up kick. Nice up kick. Looking for that double wrist lock. The that slick, the sweat, becoming a factor here with less than a minute and a half remaining in the fight. J.J. trying to roll through. As we say, it's gonna be very difficult with a guy that understands that body lock position. The bottom off just rolling with him. J.J. needs to start getting back to his feet. Fight the hands. It's a lot of pressure that Rabadanov's gonna put going down as you're seeing him carry that weight right now. Rabadanov wanting to utilize that wrestling advantage. Wilson rolling through and again, Wilson looking, always trying to find a way, but now Rabadanov in side control and has Wilson's back again. Yeah. But look at Wilson continue to try oh, to fish for the double wrist lock. That's what you like to see in a young fighter. He's working beautifully, but right now he's a one-handed fighter. And his right arm is stuck. Now he's got it free. The Rabadanov is all over Wilson. Wilson again trying to roll through. Look for the knee bar. Potentially no well defended by Rabadanov. Just lost the triangle position. 
J.J. Wilson doing a lot of good work. It's just that nothing is catching and being close. He's controlling the posture, but Rabadonov has the free right hand, delivers some body shots. Close guard of Wilson, but less than 15 seconds left. And, and right there in just that little sequence, you saw a total of nine body shots landed with nothing in return. Rabadonov said his wrestling would be key. That turned out to be the case. All right, from fistic fireworks to jaw-dropping series. The hits on Showtime, they just keep coming. How old would you say off the radar of cancer culture? Don't say the N-word. <laughs> right there, yo. You know the vibes. Let's go. Have you ever forgotten you've done a movie? There's some movies I wanted to forget. You remember? <laughs> Joe Budden impression. He's not letting it go. Come on, if a while out. Like, get it, get it, get it, get it. It's not one billionaire. The billionaire class? I'm gonna get him where they live. Oh, step into the arena. When it comes to Michael Prince Capital, what you've done before today is not my concern. That's the way of the gun. He won't stop till he gets what he wants. I am very good at settling scores. I can't lower my rifle. Uber is the future. We're kings, gods. And sometimes, you gotta play dirty. He is bold and uncompromising. Travis is the liability. Once we start, we won't stop. Are we super pumped? The judge's verdict is in. Let's go to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go now to your three judges at cage side. Your first judge, Jaron Bellell, scores the fight 30 to 27, while judges Travis Busking and David Hewitt both see it exactly the same, 29 to 28. All have it for the winner by unanimous decision, Gaggi Rabadonov. Gaggi Rabadonov hands J.J. Wilson his first loss as they embrace and show each other respect. A learning experience for the youngster, J.J. Wilson and John Gaggi Rabadonov with the unanimous decision win now 2-0 in the lightweight division and despite only two fights in Bellator brings a ton of experience he's knocking on the door of a top 10 ranking yeah look he's been fighting for a while and he's been fighting a lot of really top talent the guy's good his wrestling always brings him through in the end if he's having problems with his stand-up he goes right to the wrestling and you can see it made a difference in the fight tonight. All right, AKA celebrating another victory. And we say hello to Amanda Guerra at the fight desk. Hey, good evening to you, Moro. Yes, Amanda Guerra, Josh Thompson with you here on the fight desk. JJ Wilson going up to 155. We know he felt better at that, but Robotinov gets the win and credit to his wrestling because that's what prevailed. Yeah, John hit the nail on the head when he said he couldn't, he wasn't really getting there with this stand-up so he made the adjustment came out started utilizing his wrestling and that was the key factor of him getting the win tonight great job by him we have a ton on the line tonight as the night's going to go on we want to talk about our main event adam borge versus matt burnell that is still to come tonight look a ton is on the line josh you were lucky enough in your career to have four title fights a two-time world champ that is what these guys are after tonight the next stop for them will be a shot at that belt most likely let's start with adam borge let's talk about him look he's coming into tonight on a three fight win streak that's great but that fourth fight four fights ago a loss to darren caldwell it shook his confidence it's been coming back slowly each fight 
but it needs to be all the way back tonight. Yeah, confidence is key in this sport, in combat sports in general, especially in all sports, but in combat sports specifically, all he's got to do, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna be 100% honest, stay long. Keep him off, keep Maz off of his legs. Make sure he fights every single takedown to the bitter end. Don't just lay back when his butt hits the ground and accept the position. If he can do that, if he can stay long and you and mix up his combinations from the punching to the kicks, he can wrestle, he can do everything. He's just gotta remember that he cannot settle from the bottom. Let's go over to Mads Brunel. This is his first main event at Bellator. He told us this week, look, this is a huge milestone for him. He says he's ready for the spotlights, the five rounds, everything that's going to come with it. But Adam Vorich has an arsenal of weapons. What does Mads need to do? Mads just got to be Mads. That's all he's got to do. Like, his, his stand-up is highly underrated. It's like one of those things. It's just people don't look at it because they see how successful he is on the ground. And when he gets after you on the ground, he mixes it up. He lets you get tired from fighting to get up. And when we talked to him this week, he's like, look, I may let Adam get back up to his feet, and then I'm just going to take him right back down. I'm going to keep my hands locked, and as he starts standing up, I'm just going to mat return him over and over and over again until he finally just gives me his back or just concedes the position. And that's exactly what he did right there to Saul Rogers. He kept dominating every position, and Saul Rogers kept getting tired of chasing the takedown and not able to get it. The same thing happened with Emmanuel Sanchez. He was in on deep on the double legs. He was making Emmanuel Sanchez work. And you saw right there, he went to the body, then came back up top to the end. His stand-up is extremely underrated, and then he mixes it up so well with his grappling and his wrestling. He is, if he fights to his potential tonight, he walks away with a win. And everything that's on the line tonight, coming away, being the number one contender, that is what these guys want. Uh, let's get ready for our next fight because we got a battle of middleweight powerhouses here. We love this fight. Both of the guys at the top of the division in John Salter and Johnny Eblen. I want to talk about John Salter first here, Josh. Coming up next in this next fight. Look, he's a finisher, but that last fight of his was a loss to Gegard Mousasi. And you said in the first minute, minute and a half, we're going to know how he feels if his confidence is there. John Salter cannot afford to let Johnny Eblen, the younger fighter, the, the one that has less experience, push him around the cage. He's got to be the one that controls the dance. You hear that all the time from top fighters or other you know coaches and corners. We've got to control the dance. We've got to dictate where this fight goes. Because when John Salter is the hammer, he is nasty. He will push you around. He will get the takedowns. He will make you work. Right there with Chidi and Chikawani. What he did is he got the takedown. When he got to that back, it was over. He makes you work in every type of position. And his wrestling is always on par. It, on par. it just was not there that night when he fought Gegard. I want to know how he reacts after coming off of a loss to Gegard Mousasi, how he's going to change his game plan or if he's going to try to change the way he fights because of that loss now. On the other side, we're going to see Johnny Eblen. And look, this is so much fun. He wrestled uh, at the University of Arizona, got some cheers earlier today. We know they're going to be on his side here. Human Chico changed his name yet again. He is undefeated. And John Salter said, look, he may be undefeated. He's never faced a guy like me, but Johnny Eblen is a stud. I feel like we should call him Apollo Creed because Apollo Creed had so many names. Remember <laughs> being introduced as Rocky Balboa? It's like, how many names this guy got? Look, bottom line is he is extremely talented. He mixes it up so well. He has fallen in love with his stand-up. Sure, his background is wrestling, but one thing that he does, he started in the last fight and in this fight coming up. He's got to show that he can put it all together. He put it together in his last fight very well, from the striking to the wrestling and big shots, big transition as you're seeing right there. But the biggest thing is, though, for me, is that I want to see him be composed. He needs to be composed against John Salter. One mistake of overextending and reaching or putting his head on the wrong position, and John Salter's going to take his neck home. The biggest fight of Johnny Eblen's career, you could argue that as well, maybe his toughest Absolutely. opponent yet. 10-0 uh, right now. We'll see if he can go to 11-0. Not sure. John Salter uh, is a great opponent. Mora, we'll send it back down to you. Plenty of March birthdays up and down the card at Bellator 276 and John Salter he turns 37 March 21st only one of his 23 fights has made it to the judges tonight he tries to tame the 10 and 0 Johnny Eblen it's number one versus number three in the middleweight division. Ready to make his way to the cage the human Chico Johnny Eblen. 
transcend the human cheat code by his coach, King Mo. Evelyn at 30 has won a six in a row here in Bellator MMA. 10 and overall, six and in the Bellator MMA cake. That winning streak tied with Anatoly Tokov. And as of tonight, Roman Ferraldo for the longest in the division. But his last fight didn't last that long. No, it did not. Look at Johnny Evelyn. The thing that's impressive about him is he has continuously gotten better with each fight. He's doing and employing new techniques in each fight. This guy has got a great wrestling background. He's confident in his hands now, and now he's getting into the transitioning between the two elements. That's what makes him dangerous. And now, making his way, John Salter. John Salter says, hey, you know what? The pressure is now off. He, he fought his entire life to get a championship opportunity, faced Gegard Mousasi, ended up being stopped in the third round via TKO, but again, a guy winning 10 of his last 12 fights, and we've said it before, and we'll say it again. Lives and dies by the sword, Johnny. This guy always goes for the finish. Fan-friendly aggression, and now knowing that the title shot is in his rear view. He knows he's just another one or two very impressive wins away from getting another crack at the belt. Yeah, look, he had his crack at the belt. Now he's got to earn another one. But the one thing you got to love about John Salter, the guy is a finisher. He does not want to just ride you. He wants to beat you. 18 and 5 with seven knockouts and 10 submission wins. Plenty to like about this confrontation at 185 as we go to the tail of the tape. Very simply put, we talked about Johnny Evelyn. He is at 30 years of age, just coming into his prime. John Salter is in his prime at 36. Does that age disparity make a difference here with experience? Here's Michael C. Williams. Bellator MMA now features middleweight set for three five-minute rounds live on Showtime. We introduce first the blue corner. At six foot one, weighing in 185.8 pounds. His professional record undefeated with 10 wins, no losses, fighting out of Coconut Creek, Florida. By way of Kansas City, Missouri, introducing the human cheat code, John Hill. Cage his adversary fighting out of the red corner at six foot one weighing in 185.8 pounds just off a world title challenge he enters with 18 professional victories five defeats fighting out of Wilmington North Carolina John Salter in charge your referee Mike England start right over here bud right over here start right over there John Salter wrestled out of Lindenwood University right here in St. Charles, Missouri, 2007 NAIA National Wrestling Champion at 174 pounds. For Evelyn, he's looking to show up and show out in his Great native fire. show Great me fire. state. Round. Bell, round number one. Touch of gloves and the Southpaw Salter. Orthodox Evelyn. Little feeling out process here in the opening seconds, both pawing at each other. And it's Evelyn initiates the first offensive attack, but more of a just getting to know you, a little bit of a feeling out process, John. Well, this is, that was a nice right hand landed by Johnny Evelyn. Like, the one thing about Johnny Evelyn is, look, his confidence is growing. He is now starting to believe. A lot of people don't realize that a fighter, even when they're 5-0, they still have doubts. They're not sure. Johnny Evelyn is now believing in his ability. He knows how good he is. He trains with studs every day at ATT, and he believes that now is his time. ATT. Well-deserved reputation of taking prospects and turning them into savages. Eblin, all six of his wins via knockout or submission have come in the opening round. For Salter, he has 13 first-round finishes. Just past the minute mark. Get 
And John Salter giving a couple different reads. That was a beautiful left hand landed by John Salter on the entry by Johnny. Evelyn looking for the takedown, scoops out the legs and secures it. Salter very comfortable off his back. Despite starting jiu-jitsu training at the age of 21, a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt and uh, great fight IQ when it comes to the ground game for John yeah, Salter. Let's, let's, let's just be honest about this. There's a lot of black belts out there. They are not the level of John Salter. Salter is a world-class grappler. The guy is a phenomenal jiu-jitsu practitioner with the wrestling that he already brought, already brought, had to bring in. Yeah, and uh, speaking of wrestling, Evelyn started at the age of five, wrestled D1 for the University of Missouri. Alum include Ben Askren and Tyron Woodley. Michael Chen, I believe. Yeah, and you see right there, you see right away, Salter bring it up for a triangle attack. Look at his coaches. Johnny having to work his way through that. Look at this guy can move. He's going for, going for the arm now. Salter Johnny's looking in trouble. For the submission, the 11th of his career, looking to knock Johnny Evelyn from the ranks of the undefeated. Evelyn submit, and Evelyn slips out. Well done, and now in the close guard of Salter. Look, man, you get into those Spider-Man-like attacks, all of a sudden that web is closing in around you. That's what John Salter will do. Johnny needs to be very careful about when he allows himself to get some separation and that he needs to be bringing shots down on Salter to stop his ability to lock up those submissions. Final two minutes of the opening round and Johnny Eblen trying to deliver some short right hand. Salter trying to control his posture. This is what John Salter cannot do. He cannot sit here and allow Johnny Evelyn to be in his guard and just let him grind on him. This is not gonna be beneficial for what John Salter is capable of doing off of his back. He needs to start creating angles. He needs to start making Johnny Evelyn not want to be in this position. Interestingly, Evelyn popped up and then put himself back. <laughs> One of those, you, know, you think, I want to gain space because I want to punch it, that I want to control. Right. And that's part of when you see a guy being down in this position like Johnny, part of it is to control the posture, control the movement of John Salter who's underneath him. He does not want John Salter to what we call off angle him and start creating an angle that can put him in a submission type situation. Evelyn. There's a short forearm across the jaw of Salter who's done a Good job of neutralizing the attack of Johnny Evelyn, who's in top position, but there is a over the left eye of yeah. Salter. Salter's got a small cut over that left eye. I don't think it's really creating any kind of problem for him right now, but all these little shots that Johnny's starting to put on him, John doesn't wear damage well. You know, he's a guy, some guys, you can hit him with a brick and they, it never shows. Some guys, you breathe on them and they show. <laughs> well, both fighters, big elbow. Breathing heavily after a tough opening five minutes between John Assalter looking to bounce back from losing championship fight against Gegard Mousasi and Johnny Eblen, who in his 11th professional fight, undefeated, looking to, well, claim a, a big in. name here in Bellator MMA. No, but, you know, the number one ranked Salter. You look at that, hey, you know, with fame. everything that's jab. happened, all the, the experience Salter, jab that's fame. a good round for jab Johnny Evelyn based upon all of these shots. Here's where I think where John Salter gets that little grazing shot, a lot of times those slicing punches. I think that's what opened up the eyebrow of John Salter, but it was all of this work here when Johnny Evelyn decided to go to the ground he takes John down, but he put himself in a bad position at one point with a good submission attempt. The arm at one point was extended. I, I'm not saying the triangle was really that deep. He didn't have it. You can see by the positioning of his legs, but he was able to straighten the arm at a certain point, but not enough to really be a dangerous submission. And when Johnny escaped and it got to that guard position, 
John Salter just was in a position where he took too many shots in the round to win. Well, Johnny Eblin would uh, prefer not to get into a pitched battle. He says that he loves to control and dominate his opponent while Salter, of course, looking to try to turn things around here in the second round. My cracked crystal ball says that Big John McCarthy's unofficial scorecard reads 10-9 for Eblin. It's a good crystal ball you have. Due to the takedown and the control on the ground. Yeah, you take, you, you take a look in the stand-up. He actually landed the better shots and then on the ground. Although Salter had the attack, it never was that close to being a good submission. And he took a lot of shots, even some of them were small. So it's going according to plan for Eblin, who says he prefers to strike and wrestler. He likes the grappling game, but wants to really mix it all up. And here in the opening minute, Ian Salter trying to find an angle, trying to find an opening. That's exactly what Salter's doing. He's trying to look for that moment. He sees that when Johnny throws, he tends to take his head, and he dips, dips it off to the right or left, and he's trying to time that motion. Eblin was trying to take Salter's head off with that left hook that whiffed by. Oh, Eblin goes for the inside kick, checked by Salter. Both of them trying to navigate distance. And that was, that was perfectly solid. in range for Evelyn. Lands that body kick, right hand backs. Salter up. Yeah, right now, as you're seeing, John Salter starting to go back a little bit more often. And he's off, he's not getting his head off the center line. Absolutely, so. exactly the, the point. Notice his, his motion's actually stopped a little bit, breathing a little bit harder. It's not that he's tired. It's just he's not too sure where the attack from Johnny's going to come. And that's exactly what Evelyn wants to keep it, unpredictable. Doing a great job of really mixing his attack, going low, high, and showcasing all of those skills. And, and look, at Salter is looking for the takedown. He's looking for that opportunity. He's just not seeing it. Take a look at the base and positioning of Johnny Evelyn and the way he's kind of squatting down. You saw that nice little twitch of the leg. That's going to stop Salter at times. And now he goes for the takedown. As it did against Gegard Musasi. Hello. The twitch of the leg. Something that uh, Salter says uh, really got into his head. And now Evelyn securing another takedown and has Salter against the fence. Evelyn, yep, 30 years of age, but just his 11th professional fight. Look, 30 years of age is still young as a fighter. And Johnny Evelyn's got a lot of upside to him coming up. And, he, and he's, like I said, he's getting better right here. The and he's well preserved for a 30 year <laughs> And the fact that he's actually willing to take the fight to the ground against someone like Salter, who everyone knows is dangerous there, says a lot about Johnny's confidence. Juan, it says a lot about him that at 10 and 0, he's already ranked number three and bringing it to the number one rank, John Salter, in this fight, John. Yeah, really. Salter just waiting for Johnny to give him a little bit of a rise so he can start to pull on that leg. Sit up. Johnny not going to do anything at all. He's going to stay nice and based. Trying to keep heavy hips. Pinch down on the arm now that Salter Evelyn. trapped. Oh, and that was Salter looking for the leg lock. Evelyn's lone submission win was via guillotine choke back in August of 2018. As they're back up on their feet coming up on the final minute of the second round. And Johnny Evelyn getting the best of the experienced former title challenger john salter under a minute left here in the round nice body kick whip that into salter and those body kicks and that little twitch of the leg that he's giving it's it's giving salter problems he's not able so to read right what's coming yeah he's again john you Assess Evelyn's performance here coming up on the final 30 seconds of the second round against a guy who's been there and done that against, you know, John Salter. Well, I really like when Johnny goes into his orthodox stance, he utilizes that kick with the right leg. Stops the takedown. And he's got a good jab that he's using. When he goes into the southpaw, he doesn't seem to jab near as much. Under hook and Salter on his feet, knee up the middle. That and that awesome. was a little south of the equator. 
both guys throwing in that moment. Here at the family arena, a shot to the family jewels. Kind of both guys. A little bit off on Johnny's, but. Stay right there, buddy. Yep. Stay right there. No, stay there. Stay back here. So he will have up to five minutes to recover with 11 Hotel seconds team. officially yeah. left here yeah. in the yeah, middle you stay right there. stanza. Won't you stay right over here, though? Stay right over here. Stay right over here. Stay right there with me. I know it was accidental, okay? Just got to watch that. All right? All right, buddy. You ready to go? You ready to go? You ready to go? Time in. Fight! Action resumes. A touch of the gloves. Devlin resumes his attack. Head kick blocked by Salter. But a good round for the undefeated Evelyn, Big John. Absolutely. You called that one right. That was as good a round for Johnny Evelyn as you would think he could get at this point against a guy like John Salter. Evelyn good in the wrestling, good in the striking, and hey, from the cage to the squared circle, Showtime Boxing packs a punch this spring. Coming up in two weeks, Showtime Championship Boxing presented by PBC gives unbeaten Australian star Tim Zhu, the son of the legend, his first ticket to a fight in the U.S. It's a super welterweight bout with Terrell Gachet. And then Saturday, April 16th, Showtime Pay-Per-View presents boxing's best of the absolute best, the 27-0. Errol the Truth Spence aims to add another belt to his welterweight collection. He takes on another belt holder in your Dennis Ugas upsetting Manny Pacquiao, sending Pac-Man into That's retirement. Fire, guys, guys cannot fire. wait for action in the That's Showtime fire. boxing ring. And hey, can't wait for the next round of action here between Salter and Eblin. Great, great fight, last round. And for Salter, what is it going to take for him to salt away the victory? He's behind on your unofficial scorecard. Yeah, I've got it behind two rounds. I think John Salter needs to actually work towards using. Oh, that was a beautiful kick right up the middle by Johnny Evans. And one up high, but it's Salter coming back with the left hand. Finish your thought about Salter, Johnny. Salter needs to use his hands to get inside and work for a takedown. He's got to get to the top position. If he's not in the top position on the ground, Johnny's going to be able to stop what he's been doing again. So I look at it, he's got to get this force of fight to the ground in the top position. We continue to witness the growth of Johnny Eblen under the tutelage of the vaunted American top team. And he and Salter exchange in the stand-up, and Salter sneaks in a left hand. It's still a little wild with the striking, John. <laughs> Every time he goes to Southpaw, Morrow, I'm seeing he starts to get a little oh. wider with his shots. Right to the body by Salter. There's a right to the body by Evelyn. Johnny Evelyn, when he's in that orthodox stance, clean, crisp, straight shots, beautiful jab. He's done some great work. Beautiful kick with the right leg to the body. Salter leading with the left hand, but not setting it up with the jab as they face. Sharp right hand down the middle, right to the body. Counter left upstairs by Salter. So Evelyn using the jab as a range finder, John, and unable to find the, the range right now. Yeah, and you can see right now, Evelyn, nice kick by Salter, but Evelyn is the guy who's right now, he's controlling the distance. When he wants to come in, he's coming in, landing his shots just it. like that right there. And Salter cannot get his counters off. He's missing the target. Under three minutes left in the third round. Salter inside low kick. We'll try to do something to perhaps set up a takedown attempt, although again, against a guy who's been wrestling for 25 years, wrestled D1 at the University of Missouri. We talked about Salter's wrestling pedigree and Evelyn definitely getting the better of the striking exchanges. No doubt about it. And now marking up the face of Salter with right and caught him with a left hook. And again, notice when he's in that orthodox stance, man, the straight right hand down the pipe, just like you just saw. The beautiful jab. When he's orthodox, Johnny Evelyn is flowing. He's got the range down. He understands the timing. 
Nice check right there by Evelyn. Two minutes left in the fight. Jab from the southpaw stance by Evelyn. And I agree with Big John McCarthy that southpaw striking not as proficient as from the orthodox stance. No, not. And, but, you know, and there is case in point. But he right does across. create problems by going back and forth sure. with that. Oh, he's created plenty of problems for John Salter throughout this night. I'll tell you what, that right kick to the body has been money for Johnny Evans. We've talked about the fact that this was on paper the toughest test of Johnny Evelyn's burgeoning MMA career and thus far passing that test and looking to take down John Salter with a single leg. And this is that wrestling exchange. A lot of hardcores we're looking forward to, considering their background. John Salter was looking forward to this, he yeah, said. But he's got the legs now, and there he goes. Well, he wasn't looking forward to that, John. <laughs> Not at all. And a minute left now in the fight. Steve Mako got Johnny Eblen to American Top Team where he met Mike Brown, King Mo, Dean Thomas, and that murderer's row of competitors. Next thing he knew, he was quitting his job, fighting full time. And now with less than 30 seconds left, Johnny Eblen on the cusp of conquering the biggest name of his career, looking to move to 11 and 0. Johnny, Johnny Evelyn has been smoother than a bowl of boards and cheese in this. He has just been fantastic. The test is over. Let's see what kind of marks the judges give them. <laughs> we will find out, but I think it was a shutout for Johnny. Johnny Evelyn turning in a 15-minute performance showcasing the nuances that he continues to add to his resume, a varied attack, showcasing fight IQ, and again, against a guy like John Salter, you cannot diminish the attributes and the qualifications of the number one ranked Salter coming into this fight. No, that's what really is impressive about this performance is the guy that he did it against. John Salter's crafty, man. He understands how to fight. He understands range. He just was put off by everything that Johnny Evelyn was able to bring. The takedowns caused him problems throughout this fight because he wasn't sure when they were coming. Almost came up with the arm bar at one time. Right there, it wasn't close, but it was the one attack that John Salter had, but that body kick, man, over and over, he landed that and then right back to taking him down again. John Salter just was unable to figure out the rhythm and pace of what Johnny Evelyn was doing. And when he was in, like I said, that orthodox stance, that right hand, just beautiful. Here comes another kick to the body. All of those, those hurt. American top team is uh, home to an embarrassment of MMA riches and uh, got another stud in Johnny Evelyn. Came into tonight ranked at number three, facing the number one ranked John Salter, who most recently challenged Gegard Mousasi for the strap. And we are now officially have the decision. It will come from Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, for the decision, we'll go to your three judges at cage side. Marcel Varela, Jaron Vallel, David Hewitt, all have exactly the same at 30 to 27. I'll have it for the winner by unanimous decision. The human cheat code, John Evelyn. Well, good to have baseball back. And Johnny Evelyn, he pitches a shutout in the biggest fight of his career, passing it with flying colors as he defeats John Salter, and he's standing by with Big John McCarthy. Ladies and gentlemen, I am here with Johnny Evelyn. Johnny, that was just a beautiful performance against a very, very good veteran fighter, a guy that's crafty. You used your footwork, you had him off balance. 
you mixed up everything. You mixed up your wrestling, your hands. That human cheat code thing, it's starting to, be, starting to become real. Damn right. But hey, let me take a second to thank all you innovators, all you electricians, plumbers, um, mechanics, all the people that do the dirty work in this, in this society. I appreciate you guys for putting up uh, with all the bullshit and making this dope ass reality what it is so I can fight in a cage for their entertainment. I appreciate you guys so much. Coming in here against a guy like Salter with all that experience and knowing that he had a really dangerous submission game. Was that playing in the back of your head when you took him down the first time and he tried to lock in the triangle and tried for the armbar? Yes, of course. I took him down and I was like, this dude knows, knows what he's doing. So I had to take my time. It was kind of a boring first round. I apologize for that. Uh, I need to go back uh, to, the, to the drawing board and, and fix some things up in that area. But hopefully you guys enjoy the performance tonight. 11-0 now. Your confidence is building. Your your skill set is absolutely increasing with every fight. We're seeing it. Your coaches, they can't ask for anything more. What is it that you want? Hey, man, Musasi said he didn't know who the fuck I was. I'm right here, dog. I'm ready to take your ass out. You're an old-ass lion. I'm a young-ass lion. Let's get up in here, and let's make that fight happen. Sounds good to me. Beautiful win. Congratulations on staying undefeated. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for the undefeated. Johnny, the human cheat code, Eblen. Johnny Eblen's goal is to have that bell wrapped around his waist by the end of the year. He just openly called out the champion, Gegard Musasi. Eblen just defeated the number one ranked Salter. And now, Johnny Eblen, 11 0, 7 0 in Bellator MMA. That win streak in Bellator, the longest in the division. Let's go back to Amanda Garrett. Moro, thank you. We're going to look at those rankings here in just a second. Uh, before we do, let's talk about how this fight finished. We wondered, John Salter, was he going to have his confidence? That's not what lost him the fight tonight. No, it wasn't what lost him the fight. John hit on everything that what lost him the fight. It was Johnny Evelyn was on par tonight. What he did with the stand-up in terms of mixing it up, switching the stances. People don't understand how much that throws you off when you do something like that. When you're fighting someone, they continues to switch. They throw the hands and they finish with a kick. Or they throw the kick and they finish with the hands and they go right to the wrestling. The way he mixed it up tonight was textbook. He's on par. I mean, title shot, he's next in line, I believe. That means with that type of position, he looks phenomenal. His Austin Manaford is his teammate. So he probably doesn't want to fight Austin because there's no title on the line. Yeah. Now we understand when the title's on the line, you want you go ahead and fight your teammate for it. He just beat number one, John Salter. No one else there. Outside of maybe Tolkoff, only because Tokov is just not, he's had visa problems for the longest time. Outside of that, those, that would be it. Johnny Eblen's probably next. Let me ask you this though, he's probably next. Is he ready though? And he's so new, but he's 11 and 0 now. What do you think? If, if it was anybody else but Gegard Mousasi, I would say yes. But John Salter's been in the game a long time, and he said, when I got in there with Gegard, I never understood why people just didn't take him down or why people just didn't stand do this. He's like, as soon as he started twitching his leg, as soon as he started doing little movements, he's like, I couldn't do anything. I think Johnny Evelyn's going to find that out if he gets in there. I, do I think he's very talented? Yes. I think he needs one or two more fights before he gets in there with Gegard Mousasi. Just my personal opinion. I'm not saying he can't do it. But he has risen so fast, and he is so phenomenal. But I'd like to slow play it because he's so talented. You know, somebody has already clipped that video and said it to Gegard Mousasi. I guarantee he's going to find out who Johnny Eblen is. Uh, he probably already knew. Let's talk about what is coming up next here at Bellator, the co-made event. Mr. Wonderful himself, Phil Davis, going up against a guy in Julius and Glixis. We love this rematch. I have to say also, like, he might be Mr. Wonderful, but Julius is, is the nicest guy. He is a gentle giant. Uh, but when they get in the cage, it is about business. And here is the business going into this fight tonight, Josh. It, it's all laid out here. Phil Davis at number two, Julius and Glixis at number four. But the champion, both of them have faced him in the past year. They both lost. Let's start with Phil Davis, though, because he has had another fight since then. It was a victory. That's got to make you feel good coming into tonight. Yeah, his victory was over Yoel Romero. Uh a silver medalist in the Olympics. I mean, like, when you're talking about someone who can wrestle the heck out of you, it would have been Yoel Romero. Now, what Phil did in that fight, though, was what Big John and I have been bugging him to do for the longest and time. And honestly bugging him. Yes, been honestly bugging him. Probably bugging you because you've heard it so much. Yeah. Was basically setting up his takedowns off of his striking and just utilizing his wrestling, period. And once he got started in his wrestling against that fight, in that fight against Yoel Romero, I got to be honest, it was 
He was never looking back. He just kept going forward, driving to the legs, letting the hands go. And you saw against Nemkov, once he started utilizing his wrestling and he was getting that fight to the ground, Nemkov started having problems. But it was a, it was a little too late in the game, in that fight, for him to change the tides. I mean, he had some good positions in those fights. He just wasn't able to finish it. And it was towards the end of the fight. And he just didn't get the decision. So if he utilizes his wrestling, I think that's the way he beats Eglikas tonight. And hopefully, I bet he's walking down that ramp and he's going to have you and Big John in his head. Use your wrestling uh, because you guys harped on him all week. Let's go to Julius Eglikas. Uh, unlike Davis, he has not fought since that last fight, which was a loss there. But Phil Davis lost twice to Nimkov, and Julius Eglikas can use that. Yeah, he, all he's got to do is take a look. Eglikas just got to look how Nemkov was able to get it done. He was able to stay tight with his defense. Use his long striking, never settle on the bottom. Now, where Inglitskis made a mistake against Nemkov was as Nemkov started taking him down, he started settling on the bottom. He cannot afford to do that. Like he did with Alex Polizzi, he started, as he got taken down, he popped right back up. And every time Polizzi tried to shoot later on in the fight, he stuffed the takedown first, didn't worry about offense, he worried about defense first. Stuff the takedown and then let your hands go, make him pay with knees up the middle and the nice strong jab. He possessed his power, as we saw with Nemkov. Boom, beautiful overhand right. I would have liked to have seen him chase, not chase, but get after him a little bit more. But this was in the first round of a five-round fight. A lot of the pressure and the nerves, I think, got to him. He even said that in the fight when we talked to him this week uh, earlier. He just really needs to be patient, let the fight develop, stuff the takedown first, and then go ahead and let his hands go. This is such an important fight for both of these guys, confidence-wise, and they want to climb back up in those rankings. Moro will send it back down to you. It is all about the top 10, number two ranked former top dog in the light heavyweight division, Phil Davis, taking on the number four ranked recent title challenger, local favorite, Julius Unglixkus. And now to make his way to the cage, Julius. Did I mention he's a local favorite? No, no, you didn't. <laughs> Great response from this St. Charles, Missouri crowd. And Glixkus has competed here before, has called this area home. Born in Lithuania and coming off an opportunity to win the Bellator Light Heavyweight Championship. He lost to Vadim Nemkov, his first loss here in Bellator MMA, but he's won nine of his last ten, John, and tonight trying to solidify his place as a top contender. Well, look, this guy, he's a beast. I mean, he is a huge 205-pound fighter. Strong, he's got good boxing, he's got decent wrestling. It's not, he's not the most proficient wrestler, but he can wrestle. He, he's got the full game. It's just he's got to have a belief in himself. And I think in his fight with Nemkov, it's all the little things, Marl. It's all the things that you don't realize as a fan that guys have to go through when they're the main event. He kind of found out. Well, and as a mental health advocate, I do applaud the fact that he's been very open with his anxiety issues, with the uh, panic attacks that he's experienced in the past. But here he is fighting in front of uh, friends and family and facing, well, again, back-to-back Tough test in the form of the current champion and now the former champion. And now, Phil, Mr. Wonderful Davis. <laughs> Phil Davis has won four of his last five fights. That loss against Vadim Nemkov. Again, both Davis and Anglixkus have tasted defeat at the hands of the champion. Davis has gone eight full rounds with Nemkov. And again, John comes in at number two in a bit of purgatory, for lack of a better term. But if he vanquishes Anglixkus, he stays right there in the mix. Look, Phil Davis is so good, Mora. I mean, let's be honest. Let's take a look at some of the, the notable wins that he has. Guys like Alexander Gustafson, no, Nogueira, Machida, Glover Teixeira, Mo Law. I mean, 
look, this guy's been in against the very best, and he comes out on top. I've never seen him hurt in a fight. No one has ever stopped him. This man, his wrestling is unbelievable. He is very good and proficient in the stand-up, and sometimes I think he falls in love with it too much. This guy can fight everywhere, and he's got a Kimura that will rip the arm off of a gorilla. And stepping into the Bellator MMA cage for the 14th time, the most appearances in Bellator MMA light heavyweight history. His 10 wins in this division, in this promotion, the most in divisional history. The decorated Phil Davis, who is intent on making another run to the top at 37. Speaking of the numbers, let's go to the tail of the tape. I think you just said it because look at the real thing here is Phil Davis is 37, but man, he's a young 37. He can keep doing this because he has not been damaged in this sport. You got Anglik is very young and young in his career at the age of 30. Here's Michael C. Williams. Bellator MMA now presents tonight's co-main event live on Showtime. Three five-minute rounds in the light heavyweight division. Introducing the Blue Corner at six foot three, weighing in 206 pounds even. The recent title challenger brings a professional record of 10 wins, two losses. Originally from Lithuania, he fights out of St. Charles, Missouri. Fighting out of the red corner at six foot two, weighing in 206 pounds. The former light heavyweight world champion holds a professional record, including 23 victories, six defeats. From Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, he fights out of San Diego, California. Phil, Mr. Wonderful Davis. In charge, your referee, Kerry Hatley. Phil Davis has never lost a fight by knockout or submission. Julius Unglickskis lived in Lithuania until he was 14 now, hoping to live the American dream. And uh, here in front of his new hometown, hopes to achieve the dream of defeating one of the best in the division, Phil Davis. And Unglickskis immediately taking the center of the cage, utilizing footwork. Trying to find a way in, John. Well, Anglix, this is very tight with his defense. His hands are always up in position. Notice where they're at, right by the temples. He is a very clean and sharp boxer. Doesn't have quite the speed of Phil Davis, in my opinion, but he does throw straight shots so they get there fast. Davis has six first round finishes. Anglixkus has a three. Opening minute, very much a feeling out process, looking to potentially set traps there. That kick checked by Unglitskis. Davis with the jab. Right hand as Davis was potentially looking for the shot. They tie up Davis. And Anglickskis, good battle there for positioning, John. Very nice job by Anglickskis to stay with that, get himself back to his feet. What you're seeing right now is both guys are trying to feel out that range, see exactly where they can be, where they're not going to be touched, and where they can touch their opponent. It takes a little bit of time to establish that feel. Yeah, Davis wanting to establish the long jab. The jab's, the, the jab's gonna be very difficult for Anglickskis to see based upon, look where his hand's at. Now that does leave an opening for Anglickskis with his right hand, but it's tough to see that rising jab of Phil when it's down by his side. Rising kick by Davis. Davis wants Anglickskis to bite on his face. So far, Anglickskis isn't chewing. No, not at all. Oh, 
both guys throwing a lot of heat on that, that rise right there. Right at the midway point of the opening round. Leg kick, straight right hand down the middle by Davis. Instantly pulls it back. Nice head movement. By and good. Gwitskis is taking his head, bringing it off center, but when he throws that jab, you'll notice that he's not bringing it off center. So Phil Davis can take a look at that. The next time he throws it out, he knows where that head's going to be. Gwitskis high guard, one, two. And of course, even if he misses by a mile, he'll get a positive response <laughs> from the partisan crowd at Family Arena in St. Charles, Missouri. And you saw that last little scenario. Phil Davis did try to read that jab of Julius, and he came over with the right hand, and that head was right down the center line where it was at and the start. Davis looks for the takedown. He runs Unglickskis into the fence. Unglickskis now trying to navigate his way Davis going out of hard, but Davis Stop. gets the takedown. And look, this is just smart fighting by Phil Davis. He watched and Glickskis against the champion in Nemkov. He saw that after a while, it was the takedowns as he started wearing Julius down. Why not utilize your strength against your opponent's weakness? Davis in side control. Very nice elbow. And this is where Phil Davis is dangerous. He is awesome at the Kimura. He does a beautiful job of taking the head and controlling it with his legs, making that Kimura very tight. Yep, he has five submissions, two Kimuras, the last one against Emmanuel Newton at Bellator 142 back in September 2015. Coming up on the final 30 seconds as Davis looks to make the most of dominant position. Neon belly right now, trying to rain down some ground and pound on, on Glickskis. Maneuvering for perhaps an armbar attempt, John. Yep, he's looking towards it. And Ungrixka slips out. Half guard. Davis still looking for. Looking for the Kimura. The Kimura, but good as grip here by Ungrixka, and we go to round two. This is our co-feature here at Bellator 276, still to come. Title implications in a five-round featherweight fight. Both Adam Boric and Mads Burnell currently ranked at number two. Both know what's at stake. Boric has recorded three consecutive wins since his lone loss. Burnell, he's riding a career-high seven-fight winning streak, a quintessential clash of styles. Let's hope that that action makes us all smile as we get set for the next round here between Anglickskis and Davis. Fire off those shots. Single double jab. Let's start putting your combinations behind it and move, right? Hey. You've got to believe in your hands. got to believe in yourself. You're a badass. Let's do this, buddy. you got to believe, Big John. True statement. If you don't believe, no one else will. Who do you believe won that round? round two, There's ready. no Let's doubt Phil Davis won that round 10-9. No explanation necessary? I don't think you really have to. Let's be honest. Hey, it's he land, landed the better shot to stand up, and he had the ground. I hear you, brother. Always got to ask why. <laughs> always, even though it's been two years, I'm sure there's still a time. For what? For what? And Alex goes looking to put together his striking attack as after that Rather cautious opening five minutes. He's become more aggressive here in the second, and his, the crowd here chanting in favor of Julius Sumblitzkis. That's their guy, don't blame him. One, two, lands for Davis. A lot of fainting, a lot of body movement. No one wants to initiate the dance. No There's one. a jab by Inglitzkis. There, there is all that fainting, but no one's biting at it. So. Right hand by Inglitzkis, better body movement. Now taking his head off the there center line. Nice 
Davis. Body kick by Davis. Sharp jab by Davis. Works another takedown attempt by Davis. Very strong. High kick blocked by Glitzkus. Both fight down on those punches. And Glick is looking to, to loop that right hand around the jab of Davis. Hasn't connected so far, but he keeps on trying. Davis backs up in a straight line and puts out the left hand. There's a right hand that lands for Unglitzkus. Again, Johnny surprised at how well he secures the takedown. Are you surprised at the method, the entry? No, actually, I, it's, the, the, the entry was not a bad one based upon he made the motion that he was going with the hands and went right into the takedown. And once he gets his hands locked, that takedown is coming. And he is back inside control. The escape and now looking for that far side, Kimura. Trying to avoid the double wrist lock on on Glixkus. Who has been submitted twice. Not an easy hole to get on and gets this when he's fresh and strong. Beautiful ride by Phil Davis right there. Flowing with the motion and movement of Anglitskis. Still in good Tenacious. position. Now maybe we saw an Americana earlier tonight. And normally this is the problem. You can't force that type of submission. Once you're showing that that's what you're going for, it's going to be very difficult for you to get it on a strong guy. Right hand to the body by Davis and Glickskus has to try to find a way to either force a stand up or use his hips now to escape, but he's putting himself in the line of fire, Phil Davis. But it, it's a good job of him getting to his side. This is his way of getting up from this, since he's in half guard, it's not a bad thing. He's got to take those chances because if he ends up staying Absolutely. underneath Phil Davis, things are not gonna be going well for him in winning this fight. Never want to accept your position. 45 seconds left and some ground and pound from Davis, but you see that Glitzkus. underhook right there, Moro. That right arm with that underhook, that's going to keep Anglickskis where he's at. Phil's very good at pulling up on that arm, controlling his body position, and forcing him back to his back. For your team captain in high school wrestling, Penn State, four-time All-American, and a 2008 Division I champion. He was really looking for that Kimura there. He had the headset in place, lost it for a second. Davis took a shot from Unglickskis, but Davis in control, in top position, looking to remain on top. As we go to round three, something tells me remains on top of your unofficial scorecard, and you're not going to tell me why. <laughs> Just Lolo kidding, little bit. please you tell know, me why. Look, like, it's real simple. Phil Davis is reset, reset at this the rhythm, point, he's controlling the, the fight. The in the stand up, it. it's fairly close, and, and they're both that, having their exchanges, but once that up. hits the ground, the ground, Phil Davis is the man who is in control of this fight. Let's take a look at what possibly cut Phil on that. Here was that takedown. He shot it, didn't get it, but it was the re-entry with the hands into that body lock position, and then just physically pulls him down. Hey, more than one shot.
Round of number three. to pour it on. He has to ratchet up his offense and maybe take some it, it more risks. Risk. No doubt about it. You're absolutely right. The risk or what is going to help him get to a point where if he throws a shot that hurts Phil, you cannot sit here and just think that you're just going to out jab him. you got to open up. And for Phil Davis, probably knows he's ahead on the scorecards. What, what do you hope? What kind of strategy do you hope that he employs in this final round, knowing, you know, how much and how long you've covered his career? Well, for Phil, I, what I want to see is I want to see him use his hands and by using his hands, get into that takedown position. Didn't use his hands to try to get no, into that takedown position, and it didn't work. But he's going to get this takedown. Oh, nice job by Nice Alex. job by Alex, because but now he has to return fire as nice re entry by Phil. Phil saw it. Flix is getting tired. He saw the breathing. And the takedown secured by Mr. Wonderful. And that's what I would have suggested for Phil to do. He had that opportunity. He saw that it. And it has burnt some energy in stopping that first one. Let me make you burn a little bit more and try to stop the second one. It didn't work for him. Fight on our 329 left in the fight. Unfortunately for the partisan crowd, Julius Anglitskis has been unable to muster much of any offense in this fight, John. Credit Phil Davis and his, his wrestling pedigree. Phil keeps on looking for that Kamara. He has been going after that, but nice job of switching at least into the mount. And Glitzkis was able to get it back to half guard. I'd like to see Phil, instead of just looking for that Kamara, just start opening up, make it, make it rough on Julius, and then look for that submission hold. Davis continues to go for that far side. Kamara maybe turn into a straight. Now the double wrist lock and Julius Unglickskis here. Phil's in a position, he gets that leg over the head. He's been searching for that Kamara like a Rottweiler on a bow, man. He is all over it, but, and Glitzkis is strong, and it's not, that is a strength movement. And it not was the Kamara that cost Julius and Glitzkis the Bellator Light Heavyweight Championship in his last fight. The crowd here at Family Arena trying to rally on Glickskis, but Phil Davis continues to control, continues to look for the submission. Well, he's got a chance at a straight arm block here. He can turn it into the Kimura, but right now it's the body position. Notice how Glickskis is able to raise his head up. That takes a lot of the pressure off of the hole. When his head is unable to move, that's when the hole becomes very solid. Phil Davis looking for his Sixth submission win, his first since achieving a Kimura victory over Emmanuel Newton in September of 2015. Long time coming, and he continues to look for the finish from top position. And now he's in mount. And a reversal, and Aglitska's getting to his feet, but for how long? Not very. Bill drags him right back down. Beautiful wrestling by Davis. Bill's always good at bringing his opponent right back to the ground. He drags you in. Very strong, super strong lower body. World-class wrestling on display from Mr. Wonderful Phil Davis. Looking to make it back-to-back -back wins. While looking to hang, hand on Glitzkis, his second consecutive setback. And boy, Glitzkis going from the champion Vadim Nemkov to the former champ Phil Davis. And it's been a tough night at the office for the local favorite job. I tell you what, he has not stopped fighting at any point. You not gotta, at all. You got to be really impressed with. Look, he's and going against one of the best fighters in the light heavyweight class anywhere. He is just a tenacious fighter, and this is still not stopping. And yet, Phil Great Davis up. enjoying the ride, looking to take on Glickskis for a ride before the final bell. And punctuates his performance with another takedown. Phil Davis taking Julius on 
Glickskis to take down City. Biggest takeaway from the fight, John. You know, my biggest takeaway is Phil Davis still, when he utilizes his wrestling, he's a dominant fighter in the cage. Very difficult to deal with. The guy is just incredible when you take a look at him. He's so smooth. He's so athletic. Here he goes backside with the takedown. Beautifully performed. And that was just the start. Right there, he missed that entry, but then gets his hands locked in the body lock, pulls him straight to his back. Goes after the sub with the Camaro hold and the straight arm lock. I mean, just a tenacious effort by Davis, but also big heart by Julius Anglickskis in stopping all those attempts. And for Anglickskis, biggest takeaway, where can he show more improvement coming off of this experience if indeed he loses, which we expect that to be the case. Well, let's be honest. If you're going to look at Anglickskis, his boxing's pretty tight, but he's lost two fights in a row based upon what? Wrestling. Well, it's time to get on the mats. So you say that shirt should have wrestling on it, not boxing? <laughs> <laughs> we await the official decision. Nice round of applause for Julius Anglickskis again. Tough fight against one of the best in the division, the number two ranked former champion, Phil Davis. Let's go to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, for the decision, we'll go to your judges' scorecards. All three judges, Marcel Varela. Jaron Vallel, Robin Veal, all have it exactly the same, 30 to 27, all have it for the winner by unanimous decision, Phil, Mr. Wonderful Davis. Mr. Wonderful with a wonderful result, a clean sweep on the judges' scorecards, 30-27 across the board, Davis improving to 24 and 6. 11 and 3 in Bellator MMA. Let's go to Amanda Guerra. Moro, thank you so much. Still wonderful, Phil Davis. Well, still to come tonight, we have our main event. But the reason tonight is so important is because of what we have coming up in a month. April 15th in San Jose, the rematch. We have all, let's admit it, wanted to see AJ McKee versus Patricio Pitbull to it was the most anticipated fight in Bellator history. McKee taking out Pitbull in the first round with a guillotine choke, but did it in too early. Here's Moro with Pitbull. Thanks a lot, Amanda. Always a pleasure catching up with Patricio Pitbull. And uh, Patricio, we got to talk about your first fight with AJ McKee. Why did it play out the way it did? Um, I believe I was very calm, and that was my mistake. Uh, in that time, he kicked my face, and after that, he took my neck. But I believe. Uh, I was in the fight, the referee was in the bad position. I didn't agree with the end of the fight, but uh, that's a new fight, that's a new day, and gonna win that new match. Now, you are six and one in rematches, a statistic that uh, behooves you going into this sequel with AJ McKee. What are the adjustments that you have made in training camp in anticipation of the rematch? I'm going to be violent. I'm not going to walk back and fight in the fence. I'm gonna punch his face and walk forward. That, that is what I'm gonna do. And what about tonight's main event? We could determine the next uh, title challenger in the loaded featherweight division. Who do you like between Adam Boric and Mads Burnell and why? Both are tough, but I really don't care who is going to win. After I beat AJ McKee, I'm going to smash all these guys. 
Well, those are definitely fighting words from, well, the most decorated fighter in Bellator MMA history. It is, without a doubt, the most anticipated rematch in Bellator MMA. It goes down Friday, April 15th, when Patricio Pitbull challenges AJ McKee for the featherweight crown. We'll see you in San Jose, Patricio. See you, my friend. Thank you very much. It doesn't matter. Just put somebody in the cage with him. That's the person that he is going to fight and be ready to fight. Let's talk about Pitbull, though. Um, and, and coming off of that, what you heard, though, look, he knows how to make those adjustments, but what adjustments does he need to make going up against McKee again? He just has to learn how to deal with that speed. He understands the speed now. I think he's going to make those adjustments throughout his camp. He is a very talented fighter, and he's a veteran. He's been in there with the best guys in the world. He'll make those quick adjustments. You're going to see a different fight this time. Well, April 15th is why tonight is so important. Coming up, we have the main event, Adam Borch versus Mads Burnell. Whoever wins will have a chance down the line for a shot at the title. Mads coming in on a seven-fight win streak. Adam Borch on a three-fight win streak. Now, he admits his confidence was a little rocked when he lost to Darian Caldwell four fights ago, but he says it is back. He is on a roll and ready for tonight. So those are all the storylines heading into the main event tonight, but we want to talk strategy. And for that, Josh, you're okay, but we need to bring in Big John Cageside uh, to talk strategy about these two fighters. We tried this a couple fights ago. Apparently, you guys were not good, and, and our boss said we could try it again tonight, getting you guys both on camera at the same time. Josh, I want to start with you and Adam Borge. What do you want to see from him? I've said it all night. I want to see him stay long. I want to see him throw his punches in combinations. I want to see him get off first. Dictate the pace of this fight. When he fought Jeremy Kennedy, he was pushing Jeremy Kennedy around. Jeremy Kennedy was, some, was having some success. But the leg kicks, the calf kicks, and the combinations were key. Then when he fought Mike Hamill, all he had to do was stay long. The jab was effective. He was snapping Mike Hamill's back, defending the takedowns at all costs. And that's what he's going to need to do it tonight as well. He cannot settle, John, where his hip hits the, the ground, and then he doesn't pop back up. He cannot accept that position and just lay to his back. He needs to stay long, fight every takedown, and just be first. Be aggressive. That's what he needs to do. You know, Josh, you're absolutely right. That is what he needs to do. He needs to use that speed that I think he has an advantage in and that length. The real question is, can he do it with a guy that transitions back and forth from the stand-up into the grappling so well? That's really what it's going to be about. Adam Borch is a killer. This kid is fast. He's dynamic. But he's facing a guy that is going to grind him, and that's the difference in this fight. All right, John, we're going to give you first word now. Uh, this is where we're talking to you. Talk to us about Mads Burnell, what he needs to do. Look, he has an arsenal of weapons at his fingertips. He, th he thinks his fighting IQ is higher. How does he get the win? Look, Mads Burnell is a very smart fighter, and it's his ability to change from one element to the next that makes him special. This is a guy in the stand-up. He uses his stand-up to get into the grappling positions. And then once he locks his hand, even though watch this take that, oh, nice and soft. And then he proceeds to beat up his opponent. Even if he ends up underneath, he creates scramble situations or reversals with his sweeps that his opponent cannot stop. The guy is just a master on the ground and once he locks in the submissions now you're in trouble he starts to get to the back here's the japanese necktie starting to take place and look at the crank that he's able to get he gets the leg look at where the neck's at that is painful it's a neck crank also a choke and then when he gets the back look out the man knows how to finish and he will choke the life out of you that's what makes him so dangerous and that's what he's expecting to do against Adam Borch tonight. John, I hate to say this, it pains me. You're absolutely correct. He is good everywhere, but what is always overlooked is his stand-up. He's going to need to utilize that stand-up, though, to cover that distance and get inside on Adam Borch. If he can't do that, it could be a long night for him. He's got to watch out for those flying knees. But I think his game plans always come in where he comes, closes that distance, gets to the game, gets to the takedown, and dominates that top position. As much as I hate to admit it, you guys are the experts, uh, and you're on point with all of this. Big John, thank you so much. And Josh, that is the strategy for both of these guys. It's time to find out what happens, because at the end of tonight, we will have a new number one contender ready for whatever happens between A.J. McKee and Patricio Pitbull.
Bellator's featherweight division has seen its share of classic comebacks. Never count Joe Ward out of a fight ever. Fantastic finishes. There's the top. He got the finish with less than a minute left. That's a championship performance. And magical moments. Oh my God! Another spectacular comeback for Pitbull. I am stunned. I do not believe it. But none was bigger than the last time the belt changed hands. July 31st, 2021, Inglewood, California. A night that featured the final of the Million Dollar Featherweight World Grand Prix. A night that will go down as one of Bellator's most memorable. Two division world champion Patricio Pitbull, the pound for pound king, faced 17 0 phenom AJ McKee in an eagerly awaited showdown. And what occurred in the first two minutes of round one shook the Bellator featherweight division and the MMA world to its core. With that stunning victory, McKee further cemented himself as a superstar and now reigns supreme over one of Bellator's deepest and toughest divisions. I think a lot of people were kind of in awe that like, damn, he did it. And he did it exactly how he said he was gonna do it. I had a lot to prove and I needed to welcome the world to who the mercenary was. Looking ahead to April 15th in San Jose, McKee and Pitbull will run it back in a highly anticipated rematch, leaving the door open for the rest of the division, a shark tank of 145ers, all looking to stake their claim to a shot at the belt. Tonight's main event features two men, both ranked number two, both impatiently waiting for their chance to challenge for Bellator's 145-pound spotlight. Adam the Kid Borich enters the cage with an impressive 17-1 record, featuring an array of finishes that showcase his well-rounded skill set. And while his nickname may be the Kid, the Hungarian fighter has shown he has what it takes to be the man. He's not ready for me. I know I will finish him, and he, he already know it. His opponent, Mads Burnell, a Danish fighter who currently rides a seven-fight win streak and has quickly climbed the rankings since joining the promotion in 2020 and is ready to prove he belongs amongst the division's elite. To be the best, you got to beat the best. My mission is, of course, gold. I want that gold belt around my waist. Nothing more, nothing less. The deep and dangerous Bellator featherweight division is on full display in tonight's main event. Boards versus Burnell. It's great. I don't care who I fight. Come get it if you want it. I'm going to kick your ass just to say I did it. You know, that's the McKee motto right there. It's time to find out who the next title challenger will be. Madness. March Madness! <laughs> I love it. 
look, Mads Brunel is an unbelievable fighter. Standing, you must fight him in a fobo. Don't fight him at range. He has the advantage there. You got to step inside. Your superiority on the ground equals victory. Get the fight there when you can. for him is the distance control and his footwork. You cannot start to stay in a standing position. Don't plant your feet, constantly be moving. Time his takedown attempts with those knees, and you can end this fight quickly. Flying knee led to all three of his Bellator knockout wins, including one over Aaron Pico, who's making serious moves as well, but both Boric and Burnell looking to make the biggest moves of their career, looking to make money moves here tonight. Tied to number two. They want to be number one. They want to crack at the featherweight championship. Take us through the tail of the tape for this main event. Very simple, 17 and one, 63. These are two of the best featherweight fighters in the world, matching up to get that number one next to their name. In the immortal words of someone I know quite well, Let's get it on! Here's Michael C. Williams. Bellator MMA live on Showtime from Family Arena. The time has come for the main event of the evening. Five five-minute rounds in the featherweight division. Sanctioned by the Missouri Office of Athletics at Cageside, Executive Director Tim Lukanov. And now, introducing the blue corner. At five foot eight, weighing in 145.6 pounds, his professional record, 16 wins, just three defeats from a Husum Denmark, Matt Burnell. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner. At five foot 11, weighing in 145.8 pounds, as a professional, 17 victories, only one loss, from Algier, Hungary. He fights out of Deerfield Beach, Florida, presenting the kid, Adam Boric. And when the bell rings, the referee in charge, Jason Herzog. Okay, fighters, we're going over the rules in the back. There were no final questions from you, Blue. There were no final questions from you, Red. Touch gloves if you want. Come out, ready to fight. Title implications in this five-round main event. Could we see a flying knee from Adam Boric? May we see a Japanese necktie from Mads Burnell? Buddy ready. Buddy ready. Fight! Bell in round one. Burnell has four Japanese necktie submissions. We already mentioned all three of Borch's Bellator Naka wins have come courtesy of a flying knee, and immediately they start attacking Burnell. And there's that jab through the guard of Burnell by Boric, and a nice low kick by Boric. Oh, look at the, what, the positioning of Mads Burnell. Look what he's done. He's crushed the distance already, establishing. Oh, and there he is, a jumping knee. So early on, first 30 seconds, Boric already takes off. And I like the fact that Adam had the confidence to do that so early in the fight. Says a lot about the way he's feeling about this. There is the element of surprise, especially in the first 30 seconds of a fight, but Matt Burnell can 
attacked on the lead leg by Borch. Borch already showcasing some crisp striking, John. Very fluid with his striking. Look, Borch is good nice at the stand up. by Burnell, right uppercut by Borch. Very nice. Both guys landing there. Oh, oh some heavy shots. Burnell lands with a left hand and then looks for the takedown. Defended by Borch, but Burnell has Borch on the fence. Pummeling going on as Borch looks to escape. Borch trying to frame with that right arm, keeping Burnell at a distance away from him so he can't get into the body lock. That's what I like about Burnell. Look, notice he didn't keep fighting to just establish that. He's like, I'll break off. It doesn't matter. I'll get back inside. You know, we can nice talk hands. about Borch is striking, and it's on display with another flying knee attack. But Matt Burnell, his boxing's not meant to be discounted. He has some superlative striking skills of his own, working on it at Extreme Couture in Las Vegas. He's, he's a very good defensive fighter. Fantastic start to this fight. Guys think that they're hitting him, and they're, he, he's just rolling with things. Things are bouncing off his gloves. That was a beautiful left oh, hook the body by Burnell. But Borch is putting it on Burnell up top. Notice what I'm talking about, that range. He, you're seeing Mads Burnell make this a dirty fight inside. He is just crushing the space. And another jumping knee by Borch. And yet Borch is doing well oh, he's in the stand-up. It is Burnell bringing the fight to Borch, but Borch has been very clean, very effective with his combinations and has landed a variety of strike shots. And except for a couple of instances, you've noticed that Borch has been able to keep himself at least on that black line. He hasn't gotten his back all the way to the fence except for the one time. That's an important element for him in this fight. And Burnell continues to march forward, getting picked off by Borch. And Burnell going to the body beautifully with the left hook to the body, left hook upstairs by Burnell. Now. Good call on that one, because that thing landed cleanly. And Borch stops the takedown attempt by Burnell. See, and this is what makes Mads Burnell so dangerous, is he will continue on with this stand-up, not really working hard to get the takedown. He's just going to make your arms get a little heavy by trying to hold on to him. He'll break off, but he'll start wearing you down to the point when he does really go for that takedown. It happens. Burnell recorded his lone career knockout flooring Darko Banovic at 313 of the first round in his Bellator MMA debut in October of 2020 in Paris, France. But Matt Borch really utilizing an effective jab. Both of them showcasing some pretty impressive striking skills in this fantastic first round. Burnell really going to the body well, too. This is the featherweight division. And you couldn't ask for a better start to this. Oh, that's wow. a big shot by Owl by Borch, a knee by Borch. Matt Burnell. Borch has really stepped inside with those elbows. That beard must be made of iron whiskers because Burnell is eating some nasty shots and he continues to go to the body with that left hook to the liver. Really fast pace by both fighters. They're both putting out a lot of energy here, landing a lot of shots. 45 seconds of what has been an electrifying opening round, right up for cut by Burnell, the jab by Borch. Burnell has found a, a, a good target coming up underneath the guard of Borch. 30 seconds left in the first of a potential five rounds at 145 pounds. Burnell going downstairs, countered by Borch, push kick by Borch to the midsection. Nice uppercut again by Burnell. A head kick by Borch, jab by Borch. Both guys just going hard. Talk about shocking leather and Matt Burnell has had a great job with the left hook of the body followed by the left hook upstairs. Meanwhile, Burch continues to go aerial with the knee. Could you have asked for much more, Mr. McCarthy? You could not ask for much more. Beautiful attacks right here. Look at the flying knee coming up. Mads had his moments, Adam had his moments. Clean shots by both. Beautiful left hook up high by Mads Burnell. Comes to the body, he's gone Mads. to the body multiple times. Left hook to the body, left hook up high. And then Adam Borch comes back inside, lands some good shots. These guys were just touching each other up. Go. 
So what's in store for the encore here? Round number two. Adam Borch, Matt Burnell fighting. Like a title yeah, shot right. hangs right. in the balance. Right. And that is what is at stake, of course. Patricio Pitbull will get a second crack at AJ McKee Friday, April 15. One of the most anticipated rematches in Bellator history. And we mentioned it, Patricio can't force the rubber match. The winner of this fight could challenge AJ McKee next in the scorecard, John. Scorecard, I gave it to Borch based upon, if you recall earlier in the round, he hurt Mads Burnell. Had him a little stunned. Mads Burnell did some great work, but that was the difference in the round for me. Mid-range again, Borch going back to the knee attack and Burnell going back to the body attack with the left hook and then upstairs with a combination push kick by Burnell. Three-punch combination by Borch and again Borch trying to keep him at bay with the jab but Burnell burrows in. But he's done a really good job of when Burnell comes inside. Watch him throw those elbows, slicing elbows coming across both left and right. Borch with a Muay Thai background. In fact, was undefeated as an amateur. <laughs> Began Thai boxing in 2010 and utilizing the art of eight limbs in that sequence and now going back upstairs with the jab. <laughs> Force is gonna have to continue to try to check that kick. He's eaten a couple of them. There's a left hook that lands for Burnell upstairs. Calf kick by Burnell. That kick was caught by Borch. Sweeps his leg and takes Burnell to the canvas. This is where he's got to be careful, though. Burnell is outstanding with his sweeps and reversals. He does not just stay on his back. He gets to his side, he creates problems. This is not a guy that just guards you up. More than half of his 16 wins have come via submission for Matt Burnell. Back up to their feet. Borch looking for the Beautiful knee, elbow. Muay Thai knee from the Thai plum. Speaking of Muay Thai, an elbow. Really have to be impressed with the elbows that Adam Borch has been throwing. Beautiful slicing elbows, but look at the body oh, attack. Of I'm really Burnell. impressed with Burnell's left hook. Oh my God, it's been fantastic. Strong Borch. Over the top by Adam Borch. He is really showcasing his art of the eight limbs Muay Thai background in what has been a striking smorgasbord here between two of the top fighters at 145, and they are bringing the fight to each other. Uppercut by Borch. And again, looking for that elbow over the top. Well, the real question is this. We have seen Matt Burnell get into these types of wars before and continue on with this pace. Can Adam Bort stay with this pace? Because he has so far. Well, Burnell putting the investment into the body. Remember, a five-round fight. Absolutely. That's a long ways to go. You got to pace yourself. You got to have those moments where you grab some win. But the pressure of Matt Burnell right now has nice. been unbelievable. Uppercut on the inside by Burnell. Again, fine jab by Borch. Left hook upstairs again by Burnell. And it's the punch placement. It's the change up in speed. And there's another knee attempt. Another chopping knee. But you're seeing a, a great display of MMA strike. Oh, unbelievable. And you're seeing the, they're both touching at times. And then you, all of a sudden, you'll see them throw one with right. power. Beautiful. That that left hook to the body has been money for Matt Burnell. And it's, he's got that crossed arm, you know. Joe Frazier used it to Archie knock Moore. down Muhammad Ali. Archie Moore popularized it. George Foreman, Ken Norton, many of them. But So the boxing of Matt Burnell, a student of the sweet science. Oh! Spinning attack by Forrest, and Burnell ate it. Another body shot by Burnell. As good as advertised, and there's 30 seconds left in the second round. Burnell starting to show a little bit of damage to that right eye. Oh, and 
Boric beginning to really eat a lot of those body shots, and they will take their toll, John. Oh, there's no doubt. He has been working at punching holes in that gas tank, but I get Oh, the right hand drop Matt Burnell. Nice shot by Adam Boric. So Boric records the knockdown with the right hand. Burnell going to work, though, attacking from his back. This was just non-stop action by both guys. Look at the spinning elbow. It just ended up hitting right off the chest collarbone. But watch as Maz Brunel comes in. Beautiful left hook to the body, tries to come back to the head. Again, Adam Borch slipping that last shot up high, but the body shot still. And here comes that kick. Watch the shot here. Boom, right on the chin. That puts Brunel down, and that takes the round for Adam Borch, in my opinion. Adam Borch representing Sanford MMA. He's been working on those knee strikes with Henry Hooft and Mads Brunel. Well, Dennis Davis, his head coach at Extreme Couture, and he and Mads Burnell, they've uh, come up with uh, some winning recipes lately. Burnell looking to extend his career high win streak to eight. Burnell being really square right now, though. Look at he's not bladed at all, kind of square stance coming forward. Moro Ranallo along with Big John McCarthy, Amanda Guerra, Josh Thompson. As Matt Burnell landed another left hook upstairs. This is round number three, scheduled for five. A featherweight championship shot up for grabs. And both of them showcasing the stuff the champions are made of. No doubt about it, both these guys are showing why. They were both ranked at number two. They're just showing you all these different skill sets, heart, determination, grit. Just a fantastic fight so far. Boric putting together combinations, looking for the takedown. Blocked by Burnell. Burnell with the front kick. Boric responds in kind, goes downstairs with a low kick, and Burnell tags him with the jab. I mean, they, the pace is incredible. Incredible, and what's really incredible is if you notice, when Adam Borch explodes, he's still really fast. Boy, yeah. after all the shots he's taken. And there's another shot to the body, courtesy of the left hook of Burnell. Borch still working from the single collar tire where it is. Muay Thai sport, the one beautiful uppercuts from the right distance, John. Absolutely. And there's a right uppercut from Burnell. Oh, nice elbow by Boric. You know, I thought that, you know, Matt Burnell was, oh, that hurt him. Wow. You can see that hurt him to the and body. He switched to his stance. Yeah. He went to Sofa momentarily after tasting that nasty body shot from Burnell. Another left hook to the liver by Burnell. I thought Mads Burnell was going to try to fight this in a phone booth, and I thought that was the way he was going to look towards getting a win. But I'll give it to Adam Borch. He's fought very well at a range that I didn't think he was oh, as good as Matt. And Burnell beginning to now score effectively on Adam Borch. Continues to go to the body. Borch looking for the clinch momentarily. Midway point of the round. Those body shots, they just keep coming, and they, they're going to add up. You can only take so many. Obviously, Adam Borch is in great condition. You can tell by the way he looks and everything. But man, those shots, and he's just yeah, are horrible. And he's landed his own highly effective shots on Burnell, but Burnell keeps marching forward, coming up on the final two minutes of the third. Burnell working the body, going downstairs with that calf kick. Another leg kick by Burnell. 
Horich trying to utilize that footwork to get out of the way. Just relentless pressure from Mads Brunel. Relentless, but not reckless. No. And highly effective. You're starting to see a little bit of a swelling on the right oh, eye. Educated hands of Brunel. Nice jab, and there's another knee strike by Boric. Right back with the low leg kick. Boric starting to have a little bit of swelling on that right eye, just like Mads Brunel does. Terrific technique. Mads Burnell turned 28 March 6. Adam Borch is 28, both in their primes. And both tonight taking their careers to the next level already with what we've seen on display, oh, John. Absolutely. Uh, you, know, you don't know how this is going to end up, and then neither guy has taken anything from. You take a look, they've given everything you could ask from someone in just the three rounds. You bring up fight IQ, we're seeing a lot of high fight IQ on display here tonight. Yeah, really impressed with Matt Brunel sticking to his game plan. Hasn't altered it. He's still looking for the takedown off his punches, but not forcing anything, not making it to where he's gonna wear himself out. And Boric remains busy. It just seems like the more eye-catching shots, the more powerful shots come from Burnell. Well, right now, the, the body I mean, shots are the big yeah. difference, man. You're looking it's, at times when you're seeing Adam Borch throw his hands in this round, many of them are missing. Take a look. Yep, just left. threw three shots. Those all slid by. And the left hook by Burnell did clip Adam Borch. Oh, 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 oh. spinning kick by Borch. He is looking to finish this in fantastic fashion. It has already been a fantastic fight. Deep breath. Yep. Take a look at some of this action here. Burnell digging to the body. That left hook has been money for him throughout this fight. Right hook over the top, lands clean. Left hook to the body off of it. Just beautiful work by Mads Burnell. The pressure, he just continues to come forward. And notice, left hand hits. Notice what hits. A lot of times when Adam was throwing in this round, they were not connecting, just like what you're seeing right there. But Burnell was. Beautiful left hook high. I love the defensive responsibility of Mads Burnell. That Thank range you. able to still block, I mean, that is fantastic. That's called skill. Boric, fan club, representing his native Hungary. Looking to put, he's already put MMA on the map in his country where the sport is still very much in the growing stage as we begin the fourth round scheduled for five in what is essentially a title elimination belt between the two fighters currently ranked in number two. Big John, your scorecard, you have Boric up. I have Boric up 29-20 in. I thought Mads Brunel came on in that third round. He landed the cleaner, crisper shots. I had him taking that. that Safe to say that the scores could be different. Right. Absolutely. One of those rounds could definitely be in Mads Brunel's favor. I think the third round is definitely his. So we'll see. Mid range and Boric putting Beautiful together hands. combinations and landing. Brunel trying to block. High guard, fluid, misses with the kick. Lawrence, the busier of the two fighters in the opening minute of the fourth round. I, th I think Adam Borch's corner told him, hey, oh. you lost that round, man. You let him take control. You got to get it back, and he's going after it. Burnell has that right hand stapled to his chin. Very, again, defensively responsible, but trying to find a way to score some offense as Boric right up the middle with the knee to the jaw. Nice uppercut on the inside by Burnell. Both guys kicking at the same time. You can hear Adam's corner. Who wants it more? Yeah! 
now trying to blow in boards with the jab before landing the right boards, moving out of the way, striking first. A couple of lead right hands splits the guard. Burnell goes back to the one, two, under three minutes remaining in the fourth. That lead left hook to the body by Burnell. But it's been a great round for Adam Borch thus far, John. It's been a much better round. He's looking up at the clock, which is telling me that he stepped on the gas a little bit. He took control, just took a big right hand. Big right hand. Let's right see now. how he does in this last half. He's de I, definitely ahead right now, but he could lose it. He looked at the clock. I thought he was wanting to see maybe is it time to try another jumping knee. I mean, he's tried a few tonight. Coming up on the final two minutes, catches the kick of Burnell, knocks him off balance. And there's a push kick by Borch that sends Burnell backwards. Two minutes left in the round. Oh, nice left hook, right uppercut combination by Borich. And you're looking to see those three, four punch combinations. Those are what end up landing. It's the third and fourth shot. That was a beautiful combination by Borch. Oh, and a beautiful elbow strike in close. Another elbow, he comes and just slashes Burnell with those elbow strikes. We talked about the confidence of Adam Borch, and after that one loss, how he, he lost confidence. And you could see it in the way he was fighting. He is back. He is opening up. He's letting his hands flow. Both of them forced to raise their games. Both of them putting it all on the line because it is all on the line, John. An opportunity. This is why they've been training. This is why they made the sacrifices, spending time away from their families, traveling to America in search of their MMA fortune. Denmark's Mads Burnell, Hungary's Adam Boric, under a minute left in the fourth. Adam's done a really good job of fighting long in this round, even though Mads is crushing the distance all the time, trying to work at it. Look at the straight shots by Adam Borch. Something Josh Thompson and you spoke about as being one of the keys to victory for Adam Borch. There's a one-two that lands another multiple punch combination. Oh, and some showmanship and histrionics. What is going on? This is awesome. They're both having fun out there. They are beating the snot out of each other and loving it. I went to the fights and a dance party broke out. Matt Burnell and Adam Borch both putting on a dynamic dance of mixed martial arts. Wow. Well, John, not only do you have to score the round, you got to score uh, Matt Burnell's audition for Dancing with the Star. <laughs> the dance moves. How do you have it going into this hey. fifth and final round? Hey. Look, going into the fifth and final round, I have uh, hey, Adam Borch up in this fight. Minutes. I have Matt I mean, Burnell having forward, to get a finish. You and and it was things like this right here. Watch the elbow here. Beautiful, crisp, neck. clean right. elbow strike. Ooh. Both guys. Hey. Throwing shots, left hooks land for both of them. Man, just cleaner, crisper, more volume out of Borch. And Adam Borch kind of stopped like, what the hell are you doing? What is incredible, like, that's what you think you've seen. Oh, Adam Borch gave one back. Oh. What a fight it's been. Fire out, buddy right. Buddy right. Fight. It could potentially come down to this. The final five minutes. Mutual respect has been definitely earned in the previous 20 minutes. And you talk about adjustments each has to make here in what is the most important five minutes of their respective careers thus far. Yeah, both of them. I mean, you're just taking a look at what is on the line right now. The guy who gets the stepping forward, putting himself in place to fight for the title. It's important. And while it's always important to put on a show, Mads Burnell has to know full well that, yeah, 
One thing to entertain, he needs to win this fight. And he may need to even do more than simply win the round. He might need to have to finish Adam Borch. He needs to on your scorecard. My scorecard, he does. It could be that, you know what, he just needs to win the round with the judges. But I think that I, he's going to need a finish if he wants to walk out with that number one here tonight. Meanwhile, Borch is doing a great job of just peppering him with strikes, keeping him at distance, now backing Burnell up. Borch has done such a good job of just touching, throwing volume, every now and then lighting it up with some power. But he's been able to throw so much volume at Mads Burnell as Burnell comes in trying to crush the distance. It's just been an outstanding performance by Anna Borch. So many. Crafty combinations by both fighters, but Adam Borch again going for the knee attack. And meanwhile, Burnell almost spit out his uh, mouthpiece. But Burnell needs to try to find a way to navigate this distance, close the distance as Borch is managing to keep him at bay here, John. Borch is able to control the actual distance of Burnell getting inside, able to wrap his hands around him. He's not able to do that. Borch has just been fantastic. Foot movement, we talked about at the beginning. Footwork is key for him. Take a look at what he's doing right now, Maul. Look at the footwork that he's employing. He is circling out on everything. Playing tennis with his wife every Sunday helps with footwork as well as uh, Adam Borch. Okay, that's, oh, that's right a new one. uppercut. <laughs> right uppercut by Mads Burnell. Well, the cardio definitely, my man. I mean, he is on. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Both of them. The darting in and out. Coming up on the final two minutes, Mads Burnell has to somehow find a way to land the proverbial Hail Mary. According to Big John Scorecard, I happen to agree with you, sir, as we are under two minutes now left in this five-round feature attraction in the featherweight division. Great job by Borch. Just to hang with him, get the underhook back, make it to where that distance is just not enough for Burnell to get his hands wrapped around him, close that grip. Right back to one, two. Yeah, Burnell unable to close the distance here in the fifth. And final round is Adam Borch. Doing just enough. Keep scoring with those shots upstairs. Controlling the range. And Burnell unable to cut him off. Final 60 seconds of tonight's main event. Nice combination by Borch and then punctuates it with another jumping knee. Moore, I'll tell you what, Adam Borch has had some dynamic wins, big knockouts, but he's never had a better performance than we are watching right here tonight. There's a left hook, right hand by Brunel, but it's Borch going for the takedown, blocked by Brunel. 30 seconds remain. And now 20 seconds away from the most complete performance we have seen authored by Adam Borch, coming in 17 and one as a pro, looking to land the knee KO at the end, but he and Matt Burnell go the distance, a fantastic fight and a Brilliant performance by Adam Borch and for Mads Burnell. I mean, those first three rounds were insane. Last couple of rounds, Adam Borch seemed to take over, dictate the pace, slow it down, make it more conservative, but still very effective. Oh, it was, and more accurate. Yes. That's the big difference in it. The accuracy of his shot started to increase, and that made a difference in what Mads Burnell was able to do.
The Barge fan club, they are excited and happy about what they have witnessed here tonight. Let's take a look at what happened here, Marl, because this was just an incredible fight. Look at the action, both guys going for it. Beautiful uppercuts. Matt Burnell was able to land a lot of body shots. The takedowns, every one of them was done by Adam Borch throughout this fight, which was not the way we thought it would be. And Adam Borch was able to land these quick, explosive moments. Big knees, kicks, the shots that put him down. That was all Adam Borch. But Burnell kept fighting back. The body shot attacks was just relentless. The dance moves were spectacular. And then Adam Borch comes Not back so and says, I can do it too. But just both guys, the volume, the pace, just an incredible performance by both men. You know, Adam Borch came in. We knew he had solid distance management. Really illustrated that in the final two rounds of that fight. But a tremendous effort by both Adam Borch and Mads Burnell. Burnell looking a little worse for wear after going 25 minutes with Adam Borch. And again, we mentioned, what is at stake? A championship opportunity. Who's going to get it? Michael C. Williams has the answer. Ladies and gentlemen, after five non-stop rounds of action, we'll go to your three judges at cage side. Your first, Marcel Varela, scores the fight 49-46. Judge Travis Busking scores it 50 to 45. Your third and final judge, Jaron Bellow, 49 to 46. All have it for the Winnipeg unanimous decision. The kid. The kid is hot tonight. Hungary's Adam Borch picks up his 18th victory, celebrating, knowing that he has moved one step closer of achieving his goal of becoming a champion. He will now talk to Big John McCarthy. I am here with the winner, Adam Borch. That was. You have had some spectacular wins in this cage. You've had some incredible knockouts. You have never had a better performance than what you put on here tonight in this cage. The pace was amazing, the accuracy, the volume that you put out. How do you feel going five rounds with a guy like that that never stopped and you took that win in a grand fashion? I and mean, look, I'm not even breathing. So the hard work pays off, guys. I am the next! You aren't breathing hard, and it is amazing because you guys were going at a relentless pace. And when you have pressure coming that way, your footwork was beautiful. Your footwork moved you in and out and kept you from him ever being able to take you down, but you were able to take him down. You know, like I said, I'm a very rounded MMA fighter. I, w I wanted to kick more, but my foot is fogged up. So I know if I can kick two more calf kicks, he, he would be done. Well, maybe he's not done, but it would be uh, different. Mads is a tough guy, man. He's a tough guy. Mads is a tough guy. I want to tell you, that was a performance that puts you at number one, the number one featherweight in Bellator. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for the man that put on the performance of the night, Adam the Kid Borch. He has designs on hopefully one day being the number one featherweight in Bellator MMA, celebrating that that is his wife, Sophia. And so Adam Borch will now await the much anticipated rematch between AJ McKee and Patricio Pitbull. Hey, if McKee makes it too straight over Pitbull, Adam Borch could vie for the championship later this year to put a cap on Bellator 276. Let's go back to the fight desk. Moro, we sure appreciate it. Mandy Garrett, Josh Thompson with you here on the fight desk to close out the night. But we got to talk about that first because that was incredible. If we had any concern that Adam Boric didn't have confidence coming into this or it was a little lackluster, that put it to bed. Yeah, that definitely put it to bed. What I liked was the fight IQ. He understood what Maz Brunel was doing. He was pressing forward early in the fight to try to get him tired. He stayed composed. He changed the game plan. He wanted to stay 
stayed long, but every time Mads got in there, he changed it from the long striking to the elbows and the uppercuts, and he got started early on the calf kick, which is what got Mads to square up his stance, so it made it harder for him to shoot the double legs and shooting on the takedowns. Those little tiny changes, he saw right off the bat that Mads Brunel was coming in, and he started making the adjustments right after that. We heard Big John say that that was the best fight of Adam Borch's career. Do you agree? I wouldn't say it's the best performance, like, but I would say that it was the most fight IQ high level. So there's a difference. Like, saying something. Yes, we like to see like the high fly action of Matt Adam Boris of knocking people out with flying knees, all of those things. He fought great. You see him limping off right now. That right there is because those calf kicks that Maz Brunel was in with, he had to make the adjustments. He switched his stance a couple times. There's a lot to be said about fight IQ in the middle of a fight in a five rounder with someone who's going to keep pressing forward. So I loved everything he did. What he showed tonight was his maturity. And that I think is obviously part of what John was talking about. And he earned the label of number one contender. Josh, thank you so much. Okay, guys, while it's better to keep up, you can always catch us on Showtime in Showtime Extreme. If you missed any portion of tonight's Bellator number one contender fight from St. Louis, make sure to check your listings for replays of Bellator MMA. And Bellator returns April 15th. We are ready for this one with not one but two world title fights. The massive rematch between undefeated featherweight king AJ McKee and the former champ Patricio Pitbull. And also the $1 million light heavyweight world grand prix final. Vadim Nimkov faces Corey Overtime Anderson. But up next, Joseph Gordon, Levitt, Kyle Chandler, and Uma Thurman star in the irresistible new anthology series, Super Pumped, The Battle for Uber. It has been an incredible night here at Bellator 276. Let's take a look at what we saw. J.J. Wilson undefeated coming into the night, but Gazid Rabanov putting it into that. His wrestling coming into play now on a three-fight win streak and handing Wilson the first loss of his career. In the battle of the middleweights, John Salter, Johnny Evelyn, the human cheat code, playing it right, taking down his toughest opponent yet, moving to 11-0 and calling out the champ, Gegard Mousasi, in the process. Two of the best light heavyweights in Bellator, Phil Davis, Julius and Glixis, and we saw Mr. Wonderful going back to his roots in wrestling, and it paid off getting his fist raid. What is next for his illustrious career? And in the main event, Adam Borch and Mads Brunel, the label of number one contender on the line. What a fight, exchanging blows all five rounds. But it is Adam Borch with the performance of his career and the winner now waiting for a shot at the featherweight belt. We'll see you next time, April 15th on Showtime for Bellator MMA.